So you suddenly realize, if you just think of the story of oxygen, that our relationship to the planet is like a one-way street. The globe is something we have built. So I eventually built up, made the argument that look, the globe is a result of 500 years of European expansion, imperialism, capitalism, global market, media, technology. The globe is, was our capacity to make this sphere with the realization it's spherical, our, our habitat. Good evening, friends. And welcome to this evening's distinguished lecture by Professor Zipesh Chakrabarty, who will be speaking to us on the planetary turn in human history. So tonight's event has two sponsors, the Lowell Humanities Series and the Park Street Lecture Series. The Lowell Series has been a Boston College tradition. I think many of you have frequented some of the other lectures, but nevertheless, you know that it's been in existence since 1957, I believe. And uh, Professor Chakrabarty's lecture is the seventh Lowell event of this semester, the spring semester, and the 13th, and it's the final event of this academic year. So Professor Chakrabarty, welcome. Thank you, first of all, for coming. Thanks to the Lovell Center for this invitation. I'm very honored by it. And I must say, I couldn't have had um, a better introduction than we just had from Professor Shihadri because, you know, I was sitting there expecting what people normally do, just tell, tell you a bit, bit from your CV. And, but to have an introduction that was actually engaging with the, what I'd said or what I, what I tried to think about was extremely humbling. I felt deeply honored by it. And, and I think you moved away from a genre that we all tire of uh, and it becomes formality. So I'm very grateful to you. And that introduction is a very good introduction to my talk as well. Um, so what I want to do is share some thoughts about uh, what I think about as the planetary turn in human history and explain it. Um, I need to just take it off from where the introduction ended. I've been an insider and outsider to most disciplines I've studied. So I always had an interest in, in the world, in nature, uh, and my undergraduate major was physics, geology, you know, maths, that kind of stuff. I went to a business school uh, for other reasons, and I encountered a historian there, a wonderful historian, who converted me to the cause of history. And, uh, and then um, I, be and I loved humanities, but I guess it is out of being an insider, outsider, that some of the questions that I raise come. <clears throat> so climate change, as you know, became a public issue in the 1980s. Uh, the, the, it was in 87 when Jim Hansen, who is one of the godfathers of climate science in this country, spoke to the Senate about um, the Congress about the problem of global warming and uh, uh, not that the government was going to do much about it. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is set up, IPCC is set up 1988. But you know, different disciplines had different relationship to it and it was very interesting that um, even in 2000, when a very respected Harvard historian, Charles Meyer, <coughs> published an essay in uh, American Historical Review, and the essay was called Consigning the 20th Century to History. At the end of the century, he, being an erudite, learned historian, spoke about most things that, that you would think about. You know, the, the Great War, the two wars, the the rise of Nazism, the decolonization of the 50s and 60s, Israel-Palestine conflict, everything that you'd normally think about, but not a word about climate change. <clears throat> and that was <clears throat> 12 years after the IPCC had been set up. So in some respects, <clears throat> <clears throat> even though people were talking about it, and if you look at <clears throat> popular books on globalization and global warming, they kind of date from the same period, early 1990s. If you go to the library, 
and look at early publications explaining these phenomena. And I personally, I don't think I would have inter been interested. I mean, I was, I was not interested in climate change. I mean, when I was working on Provincializing Europe, which came out in 2000, when Professor Meyer wrote that book, I was, I mean, globalization is what we used to think about and how to think about cultural difference, how to think about whether the world was getting, becoming one too quickly, how to make difference into philosophy, think difference philosophically. So we're learning from Derrida, Lacan, Irigaray, and all those people in thinking about globalization. There was a, a devastating fire in 2003 in the Australian city of Canberra and in the environment, which I used, I, I did my PhD there and I, I love the environment, got me interested. I was interested in the source of this fire because it didn't look like the ordinary cyclical bushfires that Australia has and which regenerates the gum trees. And my friend said, it's climate change. And I said, what's climate change? So I began to read up from around 2003. And I was blown away <clears throat> when I came across geologists describing humans as a geological agent, a geophysical force. And particularly my colleague in, uh, in the geophysics division in Chicago, David Archer, saying that humans with their numbers and consumption and technology have become a thing that we have, that we are having the same impact on the planet as um, the asteroid that wiped off the dinosaurs had. So, so we are like an asteroid. And this idea that humans are like a thing that human history can be written, thought of as a thing history, as a history of a thing, completely seemed to challenge one of the very fundamental assumptions on which history writing and historical thinking rested and has rested, I would say, for the last almost 200 years, which is that human history is different from natural history. Natural history is done by scientists. Uh, they do history, but that's not what we call human history. And this was stated early in the 20th century by Croce. Croce's point was taken up and elaborated on by Robin Collingwood at Oxford. And uh, Robin Collingwood's word was taken up and popularized by E. H. Carr in his Trevelyan Lectures of 1958, What is History, and it's an extremely popular book even today. But if you think back to the 19th century, it clearly goes back to discussions of uh, necessity and freedom, even in philosophers like Hegel. The idea that nature was subject to its own laws, and the laws were then thought about as necessary laws, iron laws, you couldn't escape them. While humans were subject to both necessity and freedom. Humans had choice. Uh, Kant would say that um, humans even had the choice to make errors. Uh, humans had to find out about how to be reasonable by making errors, by making wars, doing bad things to one another, so choice was so fundamental to thinking humanity, freedom was so fundamental to thinking humanity, that the separation between natural history and human history was absolutely critical. There was, a, there was an Australian philosopher who was in Oxford when Whitehead and others were there, and Haldane was a few years younger than them. He published an essay called um, The Historicity of Things in 1930 in which he invited, he's saying, look, everything is historical, as Whitehead was arguing, that physicists write the history of the cosmos, uh, biologists tell the history of life, geologists tell the history of planets. Um, so he was saying, if everything, if everything is historical, why make a distinction between the kind of small-scale history that you write, even for archaeological history that you write, and what I do? So he literally said, you know, I invite historians to join the party. That was his expression. And a lot of Collingwood's uh, posthumously published book, The Idea of History, uh, is polemicizing against the idea that humanity could be considered a thing, that we could actually have a thing like history. And he said, look, uh, we obviously have natural functions. And when we carry out natural functions, like our body does, that's something to be studied by biologists, zoologists, doctors, whatever. Uh, but so he was saying, Nature has chronology, nature has what he called timefulness, but it doesn't have history, only humans have history because humans choose, we have motivations, we have ideas about good and bad, 
we debate things and therefore you can't equate the two. And it seemed to me that the geologists were exactly saying the opposite, that something has happened in human history which um, is collapsing this distinction. So in some ways uh, that's the shock that got me to write the four thesis essay. I mean I, I thought about what the implications were of this distinction and wrote up, actually the first article I wrote was in Bengali, my mother tongue. And I published it in Bengali. I had an old teacher who used to publish a journal and said to me, until I die, give me an essay every year. And I did, good and bad essays. But my friends in India were not interested in, at least the Bengali reading friends were not interested. They said, it's not what we think about. We think about democracy, development, you know, Hindu-Muslim relations, gender relations, stuff like that. Um, then I came back to Chicago and Critical Inquiry was running short of journals. I remember Tom Mitchell, the editor, coming to me and said, do you have anything? I said, oh yeah, I have this Bengali essay which I can try to write up in English and expand it and, and that was that and immediately I got criticized. Some people liked the essay, it got translated but that kind of got me going on climate change because then I tried to respond to the criticism and eventually that became the book of 19, 2021, uh, The Climate of History and Planetary Age. But it was, it was actually, the book was, I didn't have a didn't have a, any kind of model for writing this book. It was, it kind of was a journey through a lot of debates with fellow humanists who were disagreeing, some agreeing, some thinking with me, something against me. But um, <clears throat> the thing was that I realized that there are two kinds of histories that the end of the 20th century brought together. And both of those histories originate in human difference, uh, difference between humans. Um, but the first of those histories were different figurations of freedom, however you think about it. So uh, Jürgen Osterhammel, the German historian, actually says how the Roman word emancipation was repurposed in the 19th century, and he calls 19th century the century of emancipation, of you know, slavery, the, the demand for women's freedom, and, and uh, the, the idea of self-representation, John Stuart Mill's essay on representative government. So he said that the 19th century became uh, a century of emancipation, and of course, 20th century marked by different kinds of freedoms like decolonization, uh, civil rights, indigenous people's freedoms, uh, all of those things. So when you look at the end of the 20th century after the Second World War, it really was about freedom and, and what freedom meant. And eventually two intellectuals, I think Emmanuel Wallerstein and Hannah Arendt, in different ways tried to sum up what these freedoms were that we were all interested in. And they, they have overlapping ideas. Wallerstein said, look, there are two kinds of freedom that humans are, have been interested in. One is the freedom from oppression by other humans. And the other is the freedom from what he called thraldom to nature. And Hannah Arendt in a posthumous essay said, the two freedoms that humans were concerned with, one was freedom from want, and the other was freedom from fear. And now, you know, these ideas overlap to some degree, but you can see that they're trying to get at what the 20th century was trying to live out in, in many ways. And I think what we are doing in post-colonial studies, in subaltern studies, uh, was part of that quest for, for freedom. The other story that, uh, that, uh, is, that also comes out of human differences, but was basically the story the scientists were saying, telling without thinking of themselves as storytellers, um, uh, but they were putting out arguments, and an argument, you can think of an argument as a narrative with a beginning and an end, or a proposition as a narrative. And they were, and this was coming out of the Cold War. So if you think of the Cold War also issuing from human differences and ideological differences, social differences, this coming out of the Cold War because the war left um, both the Soviet Union and the United States interested in the atmosphere much more than they had been before. In fact, um, after the war, the pres president of, the, of the, this country and maybe the Soviet Union too, used to be given an annual report by scientists on the state of the atmosphere. And that was mainly because of three reasons. One was, of course, that they wanted to measure the fallout 
of nuclear uh, explosions. Second was competition in space. And the third one was, of course, something that had emerged during the war, which is the idea of being able to weaponize weather, whether you could cause flood or um, drought in your enemy's territory. So out of this interest in uh, space competition, atmospheric sciences, the space sciences developed. And as you know, this um, Englishman, a chemist, but really very dexterous Englishman, James Lovelock, who would eventually come up with the idea of Gaia, joins Carl Sagan's unit in um, 1960. He was there for six years. And one of the tasks that Carl Sagan's unit was tasked with was to find out if Mars had had life, and if Mars therefore could be made inhabitable. I still remember growing up in Calcutta looking at the cover of a Time magazine in this period of space competition and space science opening up uh, with an artist impression of what Mars would look like um, once it was inhabited by human beings or colonized or whatever you want to talk about. And it wouldn't surprise you to know that Mars looked exactly like Manhattan in, in, that, in that impression. That discussion among scientists gave rise to a question that is always of interest to biologists, which is, what is life? What makes a planet habitable for life? Because in that debate, there was a, basically they were trying to look at the history of life on this planet. I mean, they only know of one planet that has had life. And we now think of exoplanets, but the very, what we today call Earth system science emerged out of what I, in my head, called comparative planetology. So the question was, you know, why is Venus so hot? Why is Mars so cold? And why is this planet like a Goldilocks planet, which is exactly right for life, which has sustained life for billions of years, and multicellular complex life for 500 million years? And of course, these people were not biologists trained them themselves. I mean, like one of the books they were reading was a series of lectures that Schrodinger, the physicist, had given in Dublin in 1939. It's still a very interesting book called What is Life? And applying thermodynamics, the idea of thermodynamics to understand what life was, think of ourselves as kind of thermodynamic systems. And uh, of course, the 30s and 40s were also times when both the Soviet Union and the US were interested in systems theory. So cybernetics and all that was developing. And it's during one of those debates in NASA that uh, Lovelock suddenly said to them, don't worry about making it habitable for humans. You first have to make it habitable for bacteria and leave it to them. They'll do the job. So this idea that our life is actually connected to a much longer history of life from which we arise and that, and that inferior forms of life, like bacteria, have a lot to do with the persistence, the beginning and the persistence of life on this planet, uh, gave rise to a problem which they still grapple with in Earth systems. It's called the habitability problem. What makes a planet friendly to life? And it's kind of different from the sustainability question. Uh, so it's really in the 18, uh, 1980s, eventually, that people worked out, and this was a mistake I made in my fourth thesis as I, as I read the literature, I realized what they were saying. People worked out, first of all, that life itself was a geological force. Life itself changed the planet, uh, as life took grip on the planet. But also that geology and biology in this planet are connected processes. The planet has more minerals because we have life. There's more oxygen around. And, and, you know, so there's more oxidation that happens on this planet. So it's a much more mineral-rich planet. So this relationship between life and non-life became of, of interest to them. And they began to eventually realize that, that the planet, this is a planet on which biological and geological processes come together to create a, something that is system-like. I mean, it's really multiple processes that come together. They're precariously connected and perched. The system lurches from one state to another, but, uh, in sp but it's because these processes speak to one another that the planet has kind of maintained multicellular complex life forms like ours, 
for 500 million years in spite of five ex great extinctions. And the worry was when my colleague David Archer was saying that we are like an asteroid strike on the planet, that we, are a th we have a thing like anti existence, he really was saying that we're causing biodiversity loss or species loss at a rate which has to do with our, our, our impact as, as, a, as a thing like entity. So it was in 1983 that the NASA set up a subcommittee to devise this new science called Earth System Science. So, and they use the word system in the singular, not plural. Um, and uh, this Earth System Science people <coughs> were telling this other history. So if, if the post-colonials and the uh, anti-nationalists uh, were telling the stories of freedom, and the, free, and the question of development. So you have to realize that freedom had many figurations. Some, some of the figurations had to do with what kind of rights do you want. Some of the figurations had to do with modernity and its institutions. So Amy Césaire, the, you know, the, the anti-colonial thinker from Martinique, in his book on colonial discourse, he ends the chapter by saying, the, the colonial powers promised us modernization. They promised us factories. They promised us hospitals, schools, engineering institutions. They didn't build them. We have to build them. And if you look at uh, all the anti-colonial leaders like Nasser, Nehru, Sukarno, I mean, in the 50s, everybody was thinking modernization. There were two models of freedom. One was the Soviet Union, which stood for what Frederick Jameson called socialism as it actually existed. And, uh, and there was America. I mean, Europe by then was, between the two wars, was kind of much more inward looking uh, in terms of its own philosophy. And, you know, and one institution which has always led the debate about growth, modernization, and eventually even the, its critique was, of course, MIT. And the famous economist Rostow uh, wrote a book called Stages of Economic Growth, which has this idea of takeoff. And that was like Bible for every country. Even there was ideas that like James, James Burnham was writing about the managerial revolution, that the Soviet system and the American system were becoming like one, one another, they're like just large industrial systems, the idea of post-industrial society, bells. Um, all of these things were emerging out of 50s thinking. And both in, both in America, also in Australia, which I know a little bit about, household consumer gadgets like refrigerators, washing machines, were actually sold as bringing freedom for two women from the drudgery of household labor. So freedom was part of the advertisement for these, these things. The breaks in, at least in the West, to this kind of thinking come, begin, they begin to come with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which is 1962. And then of course, uh, the Club of Rome, Donald Meadows and his colleagues, Limits to Growth Report, which is 1972. But remember 1975 is women's uh, second wave feminism officially kind of blessed by the UN. Uh, the indigenous people's movements are going on, civil rights movements are going on. So even though there are these warning, these, these questions about uh, what price freedom or what price modernization, what price development, you still have to remember that we almost end the century with Amartya Sen publishing his book, Development as Freedom. So, uh, and his idea of the, that, you know, it's not enough to give humans choice, you have to give humans the capability for making choices by giving them nutrition, education, health, all of those things. So, uh, so there was that debate going on. And I really think it's, it's around 2015 when the Earth System scientists teamed up with some historians, historians of, but particularly with John McNeil, the respected environmental historians, that they began to, they came up with this idea of great acceleration. And in a way, that's when I think themes of world history, human history, and the kind of stories that scientists were telling came together. Uh, so what I will do is now go through these graphs. Many of you, anybody who knows about, reads about climate change will know these graphs. They're called the great acceleration graphs. They were published uh, in a revised form in 2015, but that's the decade when they become popular. And Will Steffen, who died, uh, who was the first author, died very recently, was an earth system scientist who 
who worked with uh, Paul Crutzen, who coined, who with Eugene Stormer coined this word the Anthropocene that we hear about so much. So basically what they did, they produced graphs showing what had happened in human history. A set of graphs and then they produced a set of graphs showing how the planet responded to what was happening in human history. And, uh, and their argument is that human history accelerated from 1950 on. So b one of the interesting facts about fossil fuel use is that 87% of the fossil fuel that humans have used have been used after 1950. So we really enter a major period of fossil fuel use. So I'll just quickly go through the graphs. Oh. Right. So uh, you can see that the vertical line is, the vertical dotted line is uh, 1950. And whether you look at population, real GDP, foreign directed, directed investment, urban population, primary energy use, fertilizer consumption, all of those things, you know, that all goes up exponentially after 1950. And initially, it's OECD reconstruction uh, in Japan and in the OECD countries. Then comes also the development work of the newly emergent nations. And finally, of course, if you could resolve these graphs even further, you'd see that they become even steeper after China begins to liberalize, China and India, but China is a much bigger force than India. Now, interestingly, uh, now uh, John uh, McNeil and another colleague, a German colleague, have produced a book called Great Acceleration, telling the history of, of this. Um, now you can go further back and you think human beings were thinking in terms of catching up. Even the Nehru was writing letters to his chief minister saying we have to do in 20 years, what Americans have done in 100 years. So people were, the very idea of development was the idea of leapfrogging uh, and do much faster what developed nations had taken 100 years to do. If you think of a book like um, Steven Pinker's, the Harvard psychologist, uh, Enlightenment Now, which was published in 2018, and you know, and Pinker's been arguing for a very long time that really whatever humans think they have been living very well. Uh, and in fact, in relative peace, he says, even violence is down for the last 50, 70 years. And interestingly, there are graphs that he gives in those books are you can absolutely superimpose them on these graphs. And you will see that he is speaking of great acceleration. But, great acceler but the climate change is the underside of these graphs. But he doesn't think of the underside. In fact, there's a sentence uh, in his book where he says, we have become so capable of managing things this is 2018, that we don't fear any more pandemics happening. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so this is kind of the breakdown of these graphs. Uh, as I said, the OECD, the BRIC countries, and others. Uh, and the, these blue, blue graphs are really what the data that the scientists were gathering. Um, the earlier the data was gathered by both scientists and historians. And this, the first, the top three, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, are actually um, the greenhouse gases we talk about. There's also water vapor, we don't, yeah. But the ozone graph is actually for depletion of stratospheric ozone, then the surface temperature. Ocean acidification is an interesting problem because if the ocean acidifies, then creatures, small creatures that make shells, uh, can't make them because the shells are dissolved by the acid, which means other creatures that eat them can't. Uh, so basically, this is like how the planet, if you say that's what the humans are doing, then this shows how the planet responds, how the Earth system responds to these kind of activities. Now, to add to this other thing also I want to mention, which are not there in the graphs, so it was also clear from other figures that the uh, collected, that humans have now become the biggest geomorphological agent on the planet. Now, geomorphology is we, we move more earth around than all the rivers taken together. And we move earth around even uh, in the ocean floors uh, for withdrawals and other, other things. The other interesting fact also is that um, if I go back, 
population. So you see, Homo sapiens are meant to be about 300,000 years old. And it's only 1900 that we became slightly over a billion, 1.6 billion. In 2000, we were 6 billion. Now we are 8. So you can see how it accelerates. The story has to do with improvement in food supply, improvement in public health, uh, our capacity to deal with uh, epidemics, uh, smallpox, other things that were killers, um, malaria, uh, though DDT caused all the problems that Rachel Carson was writing about, um, and antibiotics. Antibiotics definitely saved a lot of life during the Second uh, World War. Air conditioning has saved a lot of life. Uh, people would, I mean, there have been studies in Texas and other places actually showing the benefits of air conditioning. But air, air conditioning adds to global warming, but it does make for better life. Um, then it, it was in 1986 that we had one billion human beings who were consumers, who would buy gadgets, you know, cars and refrigerators and things like that. Now we are about 4 billion consumers, and the human number is about 8 billion. And the interesting fact is that every second billion has been added faster than the, than the previous billion. So there's an acceleration. Again, and China is a big contributor. Uh, another interesting, interesting fact, <laughs> bits of factoids are that in 2000, 70% of these consumers were from the so-called developed and advanced countries. So the usual culprits. Now 70% are the new consumers of China, India, Africa, Latin America, uh, these places. So, uh, in, 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 so those are the interesting differences uh, that, we, that we begin to see. And um, so when I was th thinking about this, I was caught between two very different ways of thinking. Um, when I published my fourth thesis essay, and I said, look, humanity, human history and natural history have collapsed. How do you think about history now? So people who criticized me said, it's simple. You go back to human history, and it's capitalism that's doing it. So it's human, it's not just human, don't talk vaguely about human institutions, it's capitalism that's doing it. When the first environment conference was organized in Rio, uh, there were actually two Indian activists, Sunita Narayan and Anil Agarwal, who also said, uh, you can't blame all of humanity for doing this because of consumption is uneven. Uh, the only the, you know, the rich emit obviously more greenhouse gases and the rich nations than do the poor and the poor nations. And that they introduced the idea of calculating emissions per capita in terms of climate justice and we can Come back to the question. Um, and that, <clears throat> and that was the reason why I was not happy with that answer completely was because when social scientists thought about a problem, they were still, they still were thinking with the final cause. So sometimes people ask me, so what do you think is driving it? Isn't it capitalism? So in, so in their heads, it's like an Aristotelian understanding of causality, the, that the carbon dioxide molecule up there is an efficient proximate cause, but the final cause is something like capitalism. And, that's, and capitalism also is, in Althusserian terms, an expressivist cause. It, it is what you can read off the, the planet. So it is final cause and you read it off. Whereas it was very clear in Earth system science that they were thinking about a, about a system in which causality was distributed. And as I was thinking through this problem, trying to make sense of it, a French philosopher, Catherine Malibu, who was then teaching in Canada, she wrote some very interesting responses to my essay, and then we happened to meet up. And both in writing and in person, she said to me, Dipesh, you know, the word globe in the expression globalization, and the word globe in the expression global, global warming, do not mean the same thing. And that kept me thinking about the distinction between the two globes. And I finally realized uh, 
that that uh, that the planet, which is really what scientists were calling the Earth system, I ended up calling it the planet, gives us a very different perspective on our activities than what the globe does. And just to give you one example of how the planet makes us, helps us to see ourselves, maybe I won't read it out, I'll simply tell you, is actually the air that you breathe. So, as you realize, without the air, we wouldn't be here. We would be all dead. Uh, the air has 21% of it is oxygen. And uh, now the interesting thing about the atmosphere, oxygen in the air, is that oxygen is chemically a very reactive gas. So it, it, it's promiscuous. It mixes up with other things. So if you want to keep air at 21%, oxygen at 21%, you have to supply this atmosphere with fresh oxygen all the time. And then when you read the scientists who talk about who supplies the oxygen, you realize that we humans who are totally dependent on this oxygen don't do anything to supply the air with fresh oxygen. The fresh oxygen is supplied by plants, by fungi, by bacteria, and particularly by phytoplanktons, uh, these plant-like algae in the seas. And, and, there was a, and they supply about 50 to 60% of the fresh oxygen. And I even, I've even read about climate models where they say that if the average temperature of the seas goes up by six degrees Celsius, then the phytoplanktons will die and we will shut off 60% of the supply of oxygen that we need. Now, because, so this atmosphere of the earth, climate scientists call the modern atmosphere. Now, it's interesting their use of the word modern because when, as a normal historian, I would use the word modern in global history. Uh, Christopher Bailey would say modern is from 1815 to 1914, or somebody would say from the Renaissance to now. Modern is a, so you ask for how long have these so-called inferior forms of life kept the air supplied with oxygen to such a degree that, that the level of the oxygen, while it is varied, has never gone up so much that everything became inflammable and never gone down so much that animals and, and other creatures choke to death. And the answer they give is 375 million years. So you suddenly realize, if you just think of the story of oxygen, that our relationship to the planet is like a one-way street. The globe is something we have built. So I eventually built up, made the argument that look, the globe is a result of 500 years of European expansion, imperialism, capitalism, global market, media, technology. The globe is, was our capacity to make this sphere with the realization it's spherical, our, our habitat. So the idea of global thinking for me, the climax of it is really the picture of the planet that, was, um, that came out of space that cosmonauts produced, called the blue marble. Most of you have seen it. Um, you know, this beautiful blue marble and people think this is our home. That's the globe that technology has made possible. And so, the, so our institutions, like the UN is a global institution. The planetary is about how geological forces and biological processes combine to sustain life on this planet. We are just one form of life. And you realize when you read this that not only do the inferior forms, the so-called inferior forms of life continue, keep the planet going, um, we are a minority form of life. The majority forms of life on this planet by numbers are microbial. And so I, I developed this distinction between uh, the globe and the planet and saying that, in effect, we've now become planetary, or we are transitioning to becoming planetary. Because, so if you look at this, the, 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 the human numbers and our technology and what's happened, and consumption, so I'll make these few points and, and before finishing up, got about uh, seven minutes. So, 
So it's like as human beings come into more money in China, India and elsewhere, they want to eat more protein, which is absolutely natural. There's a lot of studies showing the connection between development and nutrition and health. So I'm not saying there's anything immoral about it. It's completely moral in human terms. But it's like if you only left it to the planet to produce the amount of protein that we need, so many billions of humans who can now live in, the planet wouldn't be able to produce it. And that's the story of humans having had to industrialize other forms of life. Initially domesticate, but eventually industrialize. So even if you go back and read Peter Singer's book on animal liberation, I mean, his focus was on cruelty. But he gave, he gave numbers about how many pigs and how many cows we kill, and that's gone up. So we industrialize lives of animals, and in the vert, in the, among vertebrates, the biomass, 96 or 95 percent of the biomass belongs to humans and the animals we keep. In the, only f the wildlife constitute 4 percent or 6 percent of the biomass of the vertebrates. We've industrialized birds for our consumption, so the most populous bird on the planet is broiler chicken. 21 billion of them compared to the next populous bird, which is 1.5 billion. And now we are industrializing the production of fish. And 90% of fish supplies today come from Asia, the bulk of it from China. And you just have to go and read what's happening with salmon farming. Uh, farmed salmon is increasingly genetically different from wild salmon. And, and sometimes the, the feed that is given to farmed salmon destroys life in the seawater underneath salmon farms. But, um, but so there's a kind of, it, at different levels, it, it's, becoming, it's becoming a conundrum for us because as such, there's nothing to argue against, in Amart, about, against Amartya Sen's position in development is freedom. But the conundrum comes because the price of development is biodiversity loss, is um, uh, this kind of uh, increasing planetary role for humans. And then it comes sometimes to the in the lives of the poor in very personal ways. So, you know, from where I come from, the Bengal and the delta of Bengal, the sea level is rising. And the salt, so basically salt water is coming inland and some of the rivers are becoming more salty. And there are places where very poor fisherwomen spend entire days waist deep in the water with their cane baskets collecting small fish. And the salt in the water is causing fungal infections in their reproductive organs. And uh, recently a bunch of very rogue criminal doctors moved in doing hysterectomy on these women who didn't understand what was going on. They were getting skin problems, people were thinking leprosy, all kinds of things, and charging them money. And of course, if you've, if you've had hysterectomy, it's very difficult to lift weight. But poor women still have to lift weight. So, the, so my feminist friends in Calcutta are petitioning the government to regulate hysterectomy. I mean, never in my life I would have connected hysterectomy with climate change. And the other most interesting global planetary phenomenon is how quickly sand is becoming a rare material. And, and there are three countries in which there are construction booms going on, America, China, and India. And if you Google for the expression sand mafia, India would come up as the most prominent country where most of the sand needed for construction is being produced illegally by destroying river systems. Because, you know, desert sand can't be used for buildings. I mean, the, the, the wind erodes them into little spherical shape which don't bond together very well. It's like you can't build a house with spherical bricks. So, on the, so you, you can, however you think about it, I and mean, we've just hired David Keith from Harvard to work in Chicago on geoengineering. That's becoming planetary. Uh, so David Keith becomes planetary with his plans for geoengineering. My poor women in Sundarbans, 
become planetary <laughs> without knowing what's making them a victim of our planetary role. Uh, and let me end by saying this, that most American universities are now thinking about what to do with climate change. Sometimes I think the American, you know, presidents of American universities must secretly meet somewhere, because they come up with similar, they come up with similar ideas. And uh, we have a climate initiative, and we've had several meetings, and it's very clear that, uh, that, okay, I'll stop it here, that um, we're facing a problem that has so many dimensions that the, your diagnosis could only be holistic. Like Earth System Science is a holistic diagnosis. But all the solutions are piecemeal. And they're piecemeal because of a very interesting problem that I think is also a philosophical problem, which is that Earth System scientists imagine the planet as one. And they create a calendar of action to which we have to synchronize, with which we have to synchronize our actions. So the calendar of carbon budgets, for instance, it's a planetary timetable. And the humans are constitutively not one. Our politics is based on our sense of difference. So however we think about it, we keep splitting the planet. So when China and India say to the Western nations, now you go and do all these good things for 20 years while we develop, that's like splitting the planet. And so f we're faced with this problem of a cognitive intellectual understanding that the planet is one and it's like a system and facing something that we used to think highly of when we only thought the global, which is valuing difference, uh, making difference into a basis of philosophy, making difference into like different feminism, uh, other kinds of cultural theories and social theories of difference that we celebrated. But in, in some respects, I think it's almost a battle back again between, you know, Kant's idea of cosmopolitanism, which is saying humans are, is, humans are ultimately one, and we need to know how to overcome differences and work together, and, and Carl Schmitt's idea that humanity is not a universe, it's a pluriverse, and it is, it is constitutively not one. So maybe I'll end there, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I, well, I, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm struggling a bit with the phrase, we're becoming planetary, because is it, is it, are we actually, is there actually a change in our status, or aren't we talking about a change in our awareness of our status? That is, we've always been planetary since the very beginning of human history, that is embedded in those very Earth systems that you described so well, but the change here is that, and we're moving off of global history to an awareness of how humans have, have always been planetary creatures. And we're being faced with this disjuncture between global history and planetary history, which obviously is going to go on beyond us. And I think it's really important whether we're becoming planetary or becoming aware. So because the first yeah. is a change in status, the second is a change in awareness. Well, I mean, I think on, the, on your first point, we both agree that we are becoming aware of the planetary nature. And on the second point, I think I will agree that we were of the planet in a, in a different sense. But our capacity to affect planetary processes, to affect the carbon cycle of either 100,000 years or million year carbon cycle, that's grown. So in some ways, as a historian, I'm always interested in the question of scale, as Kalpna was saying, because scale takes time. And scale makes a huge difference. So, you know, if we were three billion people with this technology, we would have one kind of impact. But eight billion people or five billion people being able to consume, the impact is different. Uh, and that's what I mean. So in, in some respects, you know, the historian would me, in me, would uh, plead for scale. As a, as a problem in this. I think there's a hand at the back. Tara, and then I'll go back. Oh, thanks. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I have a question about your comment on the collapse of um, the connection between natural history and human history. So when I look at these graphs of the great acceleration and then the next ones that are in the blue, to me it shows a very tight coupling between our human history and 
their history in the rock and in the sea and in the air and in our, in our ecosystems. Um, and I might even argue that we could trace that back well before 1750, like feudal landscapes where we can still see today the open landscapes that were farmed um, in the geology of the of those lands and going further back into um, where there was um, burning in the Amazon uh, in, in parts where we, we assume the soil's all weathered, but actually there's this deep organic layer that now people are using for biochar and thinking, oh, this is, this is something new, but actually it's an ancient, ancient practice. Slash and burn is not a modern uh, practice. It goes back thousands of years of indigenous communities. So. I guess I'd like to challenge you a little bit on that idea that it's collapsed when actually it seems like the nature of the relationship has changed and the, the rate of consumption has changed and the impact on the earth has changed. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, actually, you, your question answers, answers your question if, you, uh, if I explain a little bit um, about what I meant by the collapse. So what was collapsing was an assumption, an assumption on which modern history rested. So from the 19th century, see modern history, the kind of history I write, or I was trained to do, is um, an invention of late 18th century. So before that, there were historians who thought very differently. So it's really as philosophers of history, like Hegel, begin to pose the problem of freedom in human history, that that leads to a distinction between natural history and human history. A lot of enlightened history didn't make that distinction. If you read Buffo, Buffo didn't make that distinction. So what collapses is an assumption of both modernity and modern history as historians had conceived them. So that's, why, that's one reason why I was never told to read geology or archeology span or evolutionary biology, right? Those, were, those became the externality of the discipline. So what collapsed was an assumption, a philosophical assumption, which Collingwood was defending in the 1930s against Whitehead. So it's like Whitehead has won the argument, at least for now, right? But Collingwood thought he had won the argument. And we were all routing for Collingwood when E. H. Carr wrote What is History, right? Or when Amartya Sen wrote Development is Freedom, right? So it's really this, see what, I mean, Again, one can go back. What happens, there's a longer history to this, the, the, not just philosophers. If you look at the history of urbanization, particularly in 19th and 20th centuries, and history of technology, and, our, it, and it's been a story of our changing relationship to seasons. So if you belong to a peasant society, you know, whether, it, whether the sun shines today, whether you have a drought, or sun, or floods, is a life and death question. The more urban you become, so when, when the railways invented, for instance, so many philosophers actually praised railways, including uh, a man that Marx polemicized against, uh, Joseph Pierre Proudhon, who said, who wrote paragraphs saying, now we can travel in any weather, right? And we get upset when the plane doesn't take off because it's snowing. So this expectation that technology will actually somehow make seasons, which I think is an intimation, intimation of planetarity, into a minor bother, <laughs> was built into the story of urbanization. And the more you get become urban, and you get disconnected from food supply, from the production of food, and all that, and, and it's technologically made accessible to you, you, then that separation gets built into your lifestyle. But the collapse that I was talking about was a collapse of an assumption a philosophical assumption on which the discipline of modern history, in which I was raised in my PhD years, rested. Yeah. Thank you. So I think there was a question back here. Oh, it's on. Uh, thank you so much for this engaging talk. Uh, I'm Meghna, and I just wanted to say that uh, not just the engaging talk, but you know, perhaps this is surprising for you to hear in a room such as this, but in my early graduate career, I remember reading your Waiting Room of History essay, and actually I cried. Uh, I'm also from Kolkata and all of that, so I wanted to give you that context. Now, but in, in terms of this talk, I 
want to push back on a certain aspect, which is let's to go to the end of the talk. We kind of posit this really interesting difference between the cognitive dissonance of ha you know, having to comprehend this on a, on a planetary scale, and yet the level of human action, and it seems that you're suggesting at the level of human subjectivity, we're operating at, at you know, fragmented difference uh, at the level of fragmented differences. And so there is this way in which the earth science conceptualization doesn't really work with how, uh, how the sort of global conception of how people are living their everyday life is working. Um, but to this I would say that is, isn't this production of difference something that which is not to kind of just say, oh, capitalism is to blame, and it's this kind of economistic system, but rather we think of capitalism as a social form, something that actually contributes towards producing certain subjectivities, and to speak to the scalar, which is something that you're interested in, that capitalism is something that is constantly operating at that kind of different, different scale, so like the, the scale of universal, universalism, and also alter, all, always producing particularity in kind of dialectical motion to it. Yeah. So then, wouldn't this, this increasing, this difference that we experience on the level of the global that, that causes that cognitive dissonance with the planetary of, the, of, of earth science, actually isn't that very much part of the production of subjectivity in life under capitalism? Um, the fact that we live in this extremely, in this moment of our extreme interdependence, we as humans conceive of ourselves as paradoxically extremely atomized. So that's what I would sort of yeah. want to ask you more about. No, I mean, it's a good question. So, so see, I mean, so first of all, the word capitalism. People use it in many senses. And as you know, Marx never used it. So it, in that sense, it's, it's a less of a theoretical word than the capitalist mode of production, let's say. Um, but however you think about it, see, it's really, even to tell the story of capital, capital and labor, what they do to each other, how they use technology, you have to, again, remake that separation between natural history and human history. Because, because otherwise, if you think, I mean, I was, as the previous, when the previous uh, questioner was asking me about the ancient process, the ancient nature of this relationship, I was actually thinking about the recent, in the last two decades, interest in theories of the microbiome. Uh, and if you think of the role of the microbiome in, in the production of yourself, your own self, and sometimes even from what I read, the zillions of bacteria and viruses in your body, sometimes they produce even the chemicals that make you feel the feelings you feel. So you can see if a Bruno Latour came to this problem, you know, and made the microbiomes also agents in the story, the whole story of capitalism would change. So what I'm saying is that in order to tell the story of capitalism, sometimes, you know, Donna, someone like Dana or Donna Haraway, whom I respect, but they would slip in the word capitalism while actually talking about multi-agent universes. But I think sometimes they don't stop to think or maybe it doesn't bother them that it's very hard to think about capitalism without again thinking about humans in a particular way humans organizing their institutions. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, because I think human institutions are based on human phenomenological perceptions, human, the limits of human phenomenology. So that's why I, what I say in this book, I've just got a book coming out, which is called One Planet, Many Worlds, which expands on the argument I was putting to you. The UN, for instance, was a global institution, because it's really set up as a bargaining forum. So when, even when the IPCC meets, the nations bargain over how much time they can get. But the bargaining is actually going on with the planet. You know, you can bargain with yourself and get as, as many years as you want, but the planet may not necessarily give you that time. And that's the conundrum I was talking about. And it's a conundrum because if you didn't think about the planetary environmental problems, I don't see anything morally wrong with people wanting to live better, having better lives, having access to things that better off people have access to. That's why I said, I. If I didn't look at this, then I'd probably be more sympathetic to Steve Pinker's argument, or even not think that Amartya Sen has missed out on something. Not his fault, because we were not talking about these things then. 
so I'm trying to complicate the story of development as, as freedom. Yeah, thank you very much. So we might take two more questions. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you if I can, I, I, I heard you speak 20 years ago in, in Galway before oh. you embarked on this journey. And I'm wondering to compare this moment, this neo maltusian moment to where you were then, right. because I, I, I'm enjoying the delicious irony of the fact that all of humanity now is a minority. Right. So what does this mean to you from 20 years ago when we were talking about other minorities and other hierarchies and other histories? Is it now, where, how do we put this back into this history you know, of emancipation and freedom you know, and stories around? It's, uh, so, I mean, the answer I, I give to you is an answer that was given to me by a philosopher in New York called Jay Bernstein, who works at the New School. And I was, I was giving I was giving a lecture on climate, and Jay said, he was my respondent, so he said this in public, so I can quote him. And he said, and I think he's right, he said, what you're doing now, Dipesh, is to provincialize humanity. And I, and I think the planetary perspective provincializes us. You know? So we, we begin to see ourselves as a minority form of life that is now dominating the order of life on this planet. And that produces all kinds of moral, ethical questions that we need to think about going forward. Yeah. Uh, so without further ado, can I ask you to join me in thanking Depeche Chakrabarti for an amazing evening. Thank you, Thank you very much.